Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Go ahead and open your Bibles to the first uh, epistle of Peter, chapter 5. Hallelujah. We, are, we started last week talking about the love of God. We're going to kind of continue that on kind of a vein uh, this morning. Praise the Lord. You know, God is a good God. How many know that God's a good God? Did I come to the first church of the frozen chosen? How many know God's a good God? Yeah. How often is God good? All the time. Like I said, God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Now, what's that mean? God is never evil. Now, we got some messed up thinking in the world. We think, you know, uh, I mean, I know. Nah. Acts 10, 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now you'll come along today and you'll, you'll listen to about 90% of the church world. They'll say God's the one making them sick. And if you have a service where you're laying hands on people to get them well, they'll say you're of the devil. Now I wonder who orchestrated that, that, that thought. The devil. the devil. Why? Because he wants to hurt people. Remember, Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to kill, steal, destroy. I've come that they might have life, Zoe, and have it in abundance, or have it to the full. Amen. God wants you to have the full life. Amen. 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 All right. First Peter, chapter 5, verse 7, <clears throat> says, casting... All your care upon him for, or be, you know, when for is used that way, it can also mean because. Okay, that, that's, that's the input in, in uh, port of that meaning of that word at that time. Hey, for he careth for you. Now, God cares for who? God cares for you. Just make it personal. God cares for me. Amen. I, I, I'm, I, some of y'all remember the day that Fawaz showed up here. Uh, my, my former roommate from Ramah, we used to call him the Jordanian Jew bomber. Because as a kid, his, his goal in life was to grow up, join the Jordanian Air Force, and go bomb the Jews. You know, that was his goal. That, that's, a, that's a goal, isn't it? You, as a kid, all you want to do is go, grow, get it, go join the Air Force and bomb the Jews. Sounds like the devil to me. Well, Fawaz was here. But, you know, I, um, one of the things that, that um, Fawaz always would say, and he still says it, he, uh, but, was, God loves me. I always remember that about him. When I first met him out there in Tulsa, he'd say, God loves me. You know, he signed any people's annuals. God loves me. He didn't say, good to see you. I'm glad you had a great year. He said, God loves me. You know, uh, he had a revelation. You know, he got set free from wanting to bomb the Jews. He no longer wants to bomb the Jews. All right? <clears throat> and we're glad he doesn't want to bomb the Jews. I am too. But he always would say, God loves me. See, God cares for you. Now, why? he said, cast all your care. All your anxiety, all your worry, all your depression, all your need, anything you're going through in life, he said, cast it all on him. There's a reason he said, cast it on him. He cares for you. Amen. Now, it's a different word where you got care, you know, cast all your cares, weights, and anxieties, but he cares for you. It's not a weight or an anxiety to God. He cares. He loves us. In the same way you care for your children, you take care of your children, you watch over them, you supply need, you meet their needs. Amen. Remember God said he meets our need exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or even think. Amen. You know, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. God cares for you. Where does the care of God come from? Well, remember Jesus said this, and in re referring to the get, uh, uh, receiving the Holy Ghost, but he said this, how shall you, being evil, know how, you being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children? How many know how to give good gifts unto your children? How many desire to give good gifts unto your children? Even when you get older, you want to give good gifts to your children. I mean, I dream about, you know, just, just having so much money. I can buy all my kids new cars and houses. I just sit around and dream about that. Love to, just love to buy them a house, buy them a car. And I'm not talking about, you know, some little, you know, Cracker Jack box thing that, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to go to the store in. I'm talking about nice cars. 
Lamborghinis or, you know, amen. Melanie wants to be my daughter. All right. I'm, hallelujah. She's, a, she's, a, she's I, you know, I, I'm one of the daughters of the church, Pastor. Hallelujah. Listen, let me tell you something. I, I've dreamed about just having so much money come in, we could, we could just buy everybody in the church a house. You know, just, you know, you know get some crazy million, $50 million, just go bless. I want to bless people. Now, uh, in the natural that's just a, that's a, a desire and a, just to want to help bless people. But Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more? Shall he give the Holy Ghost to them to ask them? But I like that part. You know, and Dad Hagin, he said, he said it just moved him when, when he says, if you being evil know how to give good, good gifts to your children, how much more shall your father? How much more? In other words, you, we, it, it, in an evil or natural state, we want to do good things, but the Father is above that realm. He says, how much more? Oh, my. How much more shall your Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? Now, I know that's to refer to something else, but, that, but the, there's something about the heart of God represented there in that statement by Jesus. Now, remember we talked about uh, in the past week, uh, that Jesus' ministry on the earth, you, we've heard it said, I've even preached it in the past, but you know, I, I've come to re understand with more clarity uh, that the ministry of Jesus was an Old Testament ministry. And, and that's partially true. Jesus' ministry was really a transitional ministry. He was the, and if I had, a, if I had an easel up here, I'd draw it. Uh, you know, Old Testament over here. Jesus' ministry was the fulfilling of the Old Testament. Okay? But his ministry also, New Testament over here, the introduction. So we're going we're to put up him where they cross over. There's an overlap here. How many of you have ever done the circles where they overlap and you color it? Well, Jesus is in the colored in part because there's an overlap. Okay? He introduces the new. He's introducing the new. He's doing something in his ministry. Yes, he's fulfilling it. He does, you know, go show yourself to uh, fulfill the law of Moses. He's, he's preaching. He's going into the synagogues. He's taking the scrolls. He's reading. He's doing, he's, he's fulfilling the old. That's right. As his custom was, he went to the temple. All right? He, he ministers in many times under the old covenant. But there was ministry that was outside the old covenant. It was, it was, by faith in the new. Amen. Amen. Jesus went to the well, and there was a Samaritan woman there. The Jews have no dealings with us. He said, Yahweh, if you asked me, I'd give you water. You'd never thirst again. It was, that's not old covenant. He's introducing the new. So we're in that overlap. Okay? So some of the things Jesus did was in operation of fulfilling the old. So other things he did was introducing the new. Okay, the, the Syrophoenician woman came to him and said, you know, my daughter's grievously vexed with the devil. Come and heal her. And, he, and she kept doing it. And the disciples got fed up with it. Finally, he turned around and said, what do you want? She said, my daughter's grievously vexed. I need, and we go cast the devil out of her. He said, it's not right to take the children's bread. What? Covenant, old covenant. And give it to dogs. She said, yeah, Lord. But even the dogs get the crumbs to fall from the master's table. He said, great is your faith. Well, he, now we're moving into the new. She's getting into operating by the new covenant by faith even though we're still in that transit, we're, we're transit, transitioning. Okay, so you understand that. Jesus, one of the things Jesus did in introducing the new covenant was began to refer to God, not as God. I mean, he would call him God, I understand that. But there was something else he did that we only found one reference to in the old covenant was in Isaiah, and he should be called the everlasting father. That's the only time we have God referred to as the Father. But under Jesus' ministry, he comes along and talks about my Father. Our, it says, pray our Father. He, he's, now, what's that? This is New Testament introduction. He's fulfilling the old. And at the same time, so one minute he may be over here doing old covenant stuff and turn right around and introduce a New Testament thing. Well, I don't believe that. Oh, really? You've heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you. Do good to them that despitefully use you. That's not old covenant. He's teaching new covenant. He's introducing the new. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So, you know, sometimes we get, you know, some people come, come along and we go, well, you know, what they, what they want to do is be able to discount anything Jesus said by saying it was all old covenant. You can't do that. You have to understand he's a transitional, his ministry was a transition between the old and the new. And he, he was the one that did it. So, he begins to refer to God as our Father. 
He's, he comes on and says, I am my father are one. Now, they, listen, they knew him as Elohim. They knew him as Jehovah. They knew him as, you know, El Shaddai. There was different names that they understood him under in the old covenant. But here comes Jesus and he, he's not using it. He's calling him my father. He wants to introduce, or let me kind of say this with probably better clarity. Reintroduce who God is to humanity. Because you see, Adam knew him that way in the garden. May not call him his father, but in the lineage of, remember this, and Adam, the son of God? Now, he wasn't like Jesus. He was created by God. God took a spirit and put in that body, and he became a li living soul, or actually, Hebrew says a speaking spirit. Hallelujah. And Adam would walk with, God would come down. We talked about this last week. I, now listen, I'm talking along these same messages, but I'm saying things in Winston, and I'm not saying here and saying things here, I'm not saying in Winston. So I don't know what I said to you. Okay? Because the sermons are kind of running together between the two churches. Hallelujah. But when, in the East, remember Adam and Eve committed high treason, the light went out, they, became, they, knew they, were, they knew they were naked, they went and hid themselves, but God came down in the cool of the day looking for his man. God had fellowship with man. God communed with man. God loved his creation. And Adam committed high treason. And, and, then, and what happened after that was God was separated from man, couldn't be in his presence. Why? Because it would kill him. God's purity and God. This is why people come along and say, well, we can do anything we want to. We can drink. We can smoke. We can, we can have sex. We can do anything because we're under grace. I'm sorry. God's holy. It's not, grace is not, you know, we, I keep hammering this. I'm going to keep hammering it until somebody stops preaching the stupid stuff. God's grace is not so we can live unholy. God's grace empowers us to live holy. Because he commanded us be holy even as I am holy. When Jesus comes back, the vesture, his breastplate, the vesture on his chest does not say Grace. It doesn't say love. You know what it says, Benny? Holiness to the Lord. Of all the things that God, he could wear on his sash, he says holiness to the Lord. Wow. Somebody go, wow. Somebody else say it backwards. Somebody say it upside down. Mom. All right. Hallelujah. So. Gee, God came, when God was separated from his man, and he finally got, he wanted to be with him so much, he had them build a tabernacle so he could come down and at least hang out near him. Then after that, he built a temple so he could hang out near him. That just wasn't good enough. God wanted to be with his creation. So he sent Jesus, John chapter 1, the word was, uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. We beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. Then verse 14 says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt in the Greek is tented or tabernacled. He got out of the temple made with the hands of men and moved into a body where he could walk around and touch humanity. Why? God loves you. God loves his creation. God wanted to be in contact with people. Amen? And in doing so, he was, you know, Jesus, we talked, I know we talked about this last week, Jesus began to represent to humanity what God does or what God wants to do for people. Now, I, I've challenged people. Find me a place where Jesus walked up to a well person and said, be sick. I'm teaching you a lesson. Walked over to somebody's house and Burn it down because they need to learn something. Took somebody's kid and threw him out in front of a, 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 a mule uh, with a cart behind it and ran over and killed him because the family has to learn to trust God. I can't find that. Now, Jesus said, we, I know we covered some of this last week. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to stop saying that. If I cover it and I covered it 14 times, that's okay. Jesus told, remember Philip says, show us, uh, uh, show us the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Isn't that what Philip said? And then Jesus said back to him, Jesus said, the works that I do, the Father in me, he doeth the works. I do the works not of myself. The Father, he, the Father doeth them. When Jesus said, when you see me, you've seen the Father, he's saying, I am, and, and he also said this, he said, I came not down from heaven to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. 
So everything Jesus did was the will of God. So don't you ever pray again about getting well. Remember when one man came to Jesus and said, uh, Master, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean or whole. And Jesus said, I will stretch forth thy hand. Now he had to take care of knowing it was his will or not in order for the man to receive. And that's where the church is in so many places. They don't even know God good enough to know what his will is. If you know God, you'll know his will. Well, I can look at Jesus. Find me somebody Jesus sent packing. Find one. Find one he refused to heal. The only person that we even come close was, was the Syrophoenician woman's daughter that was demon-possessed. And why? She was outside the covenant. So she had to get it a different way. She had to get it a different way. How did she get it? Jesus is here. I'm in the old, remember? He's in the transition. Now he's, he's on this side. He's the old covenant. She comes to him, says, my daughter's grievously vexed of a devil. He said, it's not right to take the children's bed. It's not under this covenant. You can't get it. She said, yeah, Lord, but you know what? Even the dogs get the crumbs. He turns, new covenant, by faith. She reaches over into there and gets a hold of it by faith. And see, she doesn't know what's going on. She just knows she has faith. But Jesus does. He's a transition. So he's able to minister to her out of a realm called faith where she couldn't get it by covenant. Hallelujah. Because he's, he's transitioning. Glory be to God. I said, glory be to God. But look at his care for her. So he, said, he called her a dog. That's how the Jews viewed those outside the covenant. But he had to, he, he had to get her to a place of faith. Amen. Amen. So now under the, so we look at Jesus, that's, and that's the only one that even comes close. It really is. And the only reason he dealt with it that way was he had to, he had to change he had to get her to a place, or he had to deal with her in a way different than he would have dealt with a Jew. The Jews came and said, he said, go show yourself to the priest. Covenant, old covenant. One turns around and comes back and worships him. He says, go your way. Your faith made you whole. Looking over to the new. See, we're getting that transition period. Hallelujah. The where are the nine? They're going to get Moses. They're going to get clean. This one got whole. He got his nose back, got his, he's like a country song played backwards. Got his ears back, got his nose back, got his whole hands back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of y'all heard that country song, you know. What do you get when you play country? You get your dog back, get your first three wives back, and all that, you know. Tiffany, have you heard that song? Oh, bless your heart. Has anybody heard that song? Julie's heard. All right. I'm not lying. It actually is a song. Did Dick, did you raise your hand? Oh. Okay, so the only one we can even come close to saying he was going to run them off, he, and he really wasn't, was that woman. Everybody else, you find everybody got, every, everybody that came to Jesus with a physical need walked the way that we have record of. Now let me say this. The Bible doesn't leave important stuff out. God doesn't leave things out that are necessary information. Why do he put all those genealogies in there? To track time. That was put in there. It's a calendar. God put it in there because they could track time with it. Uh, of, the, of the writing of the Bible. How many years these things have taken place? By adding all those things up. You know, it was there for a reason. It was historical reasons. God, God's not stupid. So God... And, and God God's not, of course he's not stupid. He, he's smarter than we are. And God doesn't leave things out of the Bible. He even puts the failures in there. See, had it been another religious book, all the stuff that, that Samson had done would have got left out, except the good stuff. David and Bathsheba wouldn't even have been in the Bible. There would just been a story that David married Bathsheba and they had Solomon. God didn't leave the bad stuff out. Why? Because, the, the, like in the story of David and Bathsheba, or the, the account, we see adultery, we see conspiracy to commit murder, we see murder, we see uh, penalty, but yet we see restoration. We see Solomon come as the restoration 
from all the other stuff. God's mercy in where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. God's mercy is marvelous. God's mercy is great. God has mercy greater than your failures. And that's why it's in there. Because God wants everybody to know how I mean, you could be the biggest jerk that ever walked, but his mercy is great. And if you will return to return to him and repent, he will reconcile and restore you. Praise God. Amen. I said amen. So, so we have here, um, Jesus is the, is the representation of the Father. And what does Acts 10, 38 say about him? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing what? Doing what? Good. Somebody say it real loud. What, doing what? Good. Wow. And healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Amen? Look at that. Went about doing good and healing. Now let me say this. I can't find Jesus making people sick. So making people sick is not good. I can't find Jesus killing folk. And boy, he could have wiped some folk out. I mean, he just spoke to a tree and it died. Can you imagine him walking up and seeing a bunch of, a bunch of um, religious zealots, uh, Sanhedrin and Pharisees, ripping the people off? Remember when we went to the temple? And he got mad at the temple. But he could have done more than run them out. No man hear thy voice hereafter forever. Boom. They could have all died. Not, no man eat fruit of the hereafter forever. He could have killed them all. He could have just spoke and they're going to plow. He could have said, my house be called a house of prayer. You made a den of thieves and therefore no man will ever hear your voice again. Boom. But he didn't do that, did he? No. Why? Because mercy. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to redeem mankind. He loves humanity. Now, I, I was struck. Boy, was I struck. And I, I've been pondering on this for a few days. Uh, some of y'all know who John Duzo is. John's a friend of ours. And uh, we, we went to Raymond at the same time. Um, and then he, he, when he first started traveling, he, he, one of our church, our church is one of his first churches he came to. Um, and then he went with Ed Elliott overseas and, and helped pastor, pastors until they, you know, to build churches after all these big, huge evangelistic evangelistic crusades. And he pastors in Cranberry Township, Pennsylvania now. He said something this week. He said, how to find out if you're walking in love or not. When you see people living as him, do you get ticked off at them? And I went, Oop. <laughs> Now, I do not condone the sin. I don't condone the spirit behind the sin. But the people need help. And I can't help them mad at them. So I've been, I, that's been working on me this week. I'm about, oh, let me think now, Lord. Oh, oh. Has this got... Is that, ooh, that ticks me off. I'm going to have to, uh, you know. Now, I still, I still want to take a stand for righteousness. I still want to take a stand for the word. But we've got to love people. Why? Because eternity is a long time to spend in hell. Just, just saying. All right? That's a long time to spend in hell. That's a long time to spend in torment. That's a long time to spend alienated from God. Uh, 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 forever. We have to have the heart of the Father. God looked at man in his degradation and his rebellion and his discontent and his, his snarliness and he sent Jesus because he loved him. Amen. Ephesians says even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together in Christ. Now I know that's heavy. Even when we were dead, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together in Christ. Raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Now, I shared this last week. I don't know if I shared it over here or not, but in Winston. You know, when Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead and sat down at the right hand of the Father, uh, guess what? Your name was written down. How many of you ever heard the old song we sing in church? There's a new name written down in glory and it's mine. Oh, it's mine. That's one of the most inaccurate songs. I love it. I used to sing it. I grew up, you know, we, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Then the other song, you know, um, I don't know what day it was. Somebody, somebody shared this last week, I thought so. Who shared that song last week or so? I don't know what day it was, somebody touched me. I don't know what day it was, somebody. And then we start singing, it was on a Monday, somebody touched And all the people in the church who got saved on a Monday stand up. And you go through all the days of the week. You know, and of course, usually Wednesday and Sunday is when the most of the people stood up. Yeah. You know, 
Sunday, Wednesday night church or Sunday night or Sunday church, they got saved. You know, so everybody's saying, you know, you know what? Somebody touched me. Must have been the hand of the Lord. Then we sing, I don't know what day it was. But some, you just got, I got saved, but I don't remember what day it was. I know I got saved. Now, and then there's a new name written down in glory. We sing these songs about the day we got saved. But you know what? As far as God's concerned, the day you got saved is the day Jesus was raised from the dead and sat down at his right hand. How do you know? Because the Bible tells us that in the, in the book of Revelation that the people who were raised up and, and are cast into the lake of fire which, forever, which is the second death, are whose names were blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. You got wrote down when Jesus got raised. People who die without him get blotted out. What's that? It's redacted. Anybody ever heard of a redacted government? You know, of course, right now with politics, where there are, there are all kinds of stuff coming out all the time, redacted, and there's so much black on them, and you're marking out saying you can't even read them. It's a secret, you know. And that's the stuff they share with people they shouldn't have shared it with, but the real important stuff gets redacted because you don't want that in public consumption. It's dangerous. Our, our military, our spies, our, their lives get come in danger. Your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. Those people that, that are out there rebelling against God, guess what? Their name is in the Lamb's book of life right now. Those who are getting out there and calling and cursing God and calling Jesus a fag and, you know, and, 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 and painting his picture in urine while they're still breathing, their name is in the Lamb's book of life. Now, if they don't come to know Jesus... And they die without him, it gets blotted out. Can you imagine the suffering of, of eternity? Knowing once you find out heaven's real, hell is real, I had an opportunity to accept Jesus, and your name got blotted out? Now, let's get on the other side of this. God loves so people so much, he's already given them the credit to get there. All they got to do is accept it. Jesus didn't come back down and get on the cross and save you. He's already done it. And he loves people so much, he did it all on credit for them. All they got to do is accept it. They signed the dotted line with their confession. God loves humanity. If you love God, you should love what he loves. I know that's, listen, there's stuff going on, or there's stuff going on that just can, can get you spun up. I'm telling you stuff going on that can get you spun up. And as a citizen of a country, I mean, I will make, I will make political choices and votes and stuff, you know, that I believe are in the best interest of the kingdom of God. Not my pocketbook, but the kingdom of God. All right? Now, if somebody says, what are you, Pastor? I'm a constitutional conservative. I believe in the Constitution. I, I believe it's a God-ordained document. I believe it was God-breathed. Amen? I am conservative because I don't believe in the liberal mindset. I don't believe in homosexual marriage. I don't believe in transgender. I'm not going to marry people who are homosexual. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going. I'm not going to marry people who are transgender. I'm not going to marry people who want to marry their dog, or their cat, or their dolphin. I'm not going to do it. Hello. Woman went to jail because she wouldn't do wouldn't do the thing without bail. Do you know who gets without bail? Murderers, people who are threats to society. And they sent the woman to jail without bail because she wouldn't issue a license. We're, we're living in, in, in judicial tyranny right now. Liberal, crazy, and white out judges are doing stuff that are to attack Christians. I don't believe in that, you know. But I still love them. We have to, God wants to bring them into the kingdom. God wants them to accept his plan of salvation. His spirit strives with them. But I'm going to pray for our nation. I'm going to, I'm going to vote ways that, that would uh, secure, at least with my, what I can tell the best, secure an opportunity to change some of these things in the natural. Because we want to get the gospel out to the nations. We want to still minister to people. We don't want people bound in sin. Hello? We want them free. Hallelujah. The people's names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. God cares for people. Now, let me, let me, so now let's kind of get over here. We, you kind of get this back to where I was going. God cares for humanity. Remember, cast all your care on him, he careth for you. 
Jesus, inter- I got all of this because we're in a Jesus introducing recovering the covenant. Da, 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 da. Jesus introduced the Father, introduces the Father. Suddenly, it's no longer about the God who, if you missed your sacrifice this week, your toast next week. Right. You're like my iPhone. <laughs> Extra crispy. Those circuits are fried. Jesus introduces the Father. And everywhere he begins to talk about God, all of a sudden there's a different... Now listen, he still talks about hell and still talks about the... Old, there's still the truth of that. So, so you know, understand, God never wants us to get an un, a non-balanced view of things. Remember Jesus said that, you know, this one they were taken out and cast out of darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth, that kind of stuff. In other words, there's going to be consequences for rejecting it. But he kept introducing and kept referring to the Father. Why was he doing that? Because he wanted people to come to an understanding that God is not about trying to destroy you. He's here because he loves you. I'm here because God loves you. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I came to reveal the love of the Father. Let's run over to Matthew. We're going to close over here in Matthew. Chapter 6. And we'll pick up We'll pick up verse 24. This is good for prosperity people. I believe in biblical prosperity. I am not an anti, name it, claim it, frame it, you know, blab it, grab it bunch. I believe in all of it. I'm one of them. But I blab it and grab it in line with the word. I name it, claim it, frame it in line with the word. All right? See, people say those things because they want to, you know, and that's the stuff you can't do. You got, you got to be, you got to have enough biblical whatever to address what's wrong without throwing out the baby. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, the reason for the bathwater is to get the baby cleaned up. Uh, Matthew chapter six, verse twenty-four: No man can serve two masters. Well, pff, not not the bunch today. They can do both. For either he will hate the one or, and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. I mean, you cannot serve God and mammon. Now, the, word, the Greek word where mammon comes from is a reference to money. Okay? I mean, you can't serve God and money. Well, what, what, uh, what does the scripture say? The love of money. Not money. You, yeah, I'll tell you one thing. Money is the root of all evil. Go, go read your Bible. Go read your Bible. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money has no evil are good tendencies to it, it is neutral. It is a thing. It's an inanimate object. It does not have a personality. It does not have a spirit on it. It does nothing, none of that. It's how it's used. And if you love it more than you love God, then it's become your master. So Jesus said, you can't serve two men. You can't serve God in money. Okay. In other words, we're going to have to have the right mindset. You, know, you always have to have the right mindset when it comes to money. Trust me, money, the love of it, will mess you up. I said it, it will mess you up. You get caught up. In, one, one scripture talks about piercing ourselves with sorrows. We, have to be, we just have to watch money. Amen? Not that it can do anything, but the spirits that try to drive you to do things other than serve God will use money as a, as a, as a tool to draw you away. Well, Pastor, I'm not going to be here this Sunday. Why not? Well, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm not going to be here the next 10 Sundays because if I, if I work, I can make an extra, you know, $1,000 over that 10 weeks. Praise God. God gave me that. Yeah, are you going to be in church any other time? No, that's the only time I can come to church Sunday morning. So you're going to serve the money rather than God. You know, God can take, listen, I know sometimes you have to take jobs and there's, there's different things, but you've got to make sure God stays first. Amen. We can get so caught up with making money or, or fi- you know, there's people who go out, they don't come, they come to church on Sunday mornings, but they don't come Sunday nights, they don't come Wednesday nights because of their, their group they're in. That's when they do all their work. They draw circles on Sundays and they deliver on Wednesdays. And they can't be, so I, I know a pastor had a, church, had a group, he had 600 people in his church. Sunday night he had 60. He, and then when they had their monthly meeting somewhere, he had 60. 
He said, we, one week you have 600, next week you have 60. Because they all went out to the little meeting. See, you can't serve God and mammon. All right? Why? Because you'll, you'll either love one or you'll hate the other. You can get so in love with making money, you won't even serve God. That went over big. Now listen, don't, I'm not knocking people, you have to work, you, you're having to work on Sunday, but you know what, there's Wednesday night services, there's Sunday night services. You need, you need to find ways to be in church and be around, around the people of God. Amen. Usually if you're working Sunday mornings, you're not working Wednesday nights. I'm tired. Let the weak say I'm strong. Let the poor say I'm rich. All right, here we go. Therefore, and that was just a little bit side drink. Therefore, I say, and you take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, neither for your body, what you shall put on it, is not life more than meat and the body of the raiment. Behold the fowls of the heirs, of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap, and they don't, don't gather into barns, let your heaven, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? In other words, God takes care of the birds. Now, let me say this. Jesus is not saying here, quit your job, go home and do nothing, you know, God's going to feed you. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, as an allegory, look, these birds, well, really, they can't do any of those things, but yet God takes care of them. Which is you about taking thought, can add one cubit to your stature, or to your height. Y'all know the story about Janie. Remember? She, we, she used to get little text messages on her phone. And it was a daily scripture. My life, my daily bread, your little thing, you pull out the little thing on the middle of the table. And she used to pull out her little, she'd get a text scripture. And she, you know, Janie's 5'2". She's really 5'1 and a half. Anyway, she claims 5'2". All right? And so she's reaching up, trying to get something out of the cabinet, and she can't reach it, and she can't reach it. And she went, I'm so tired of being so doggone short. And her phone went, bzzz, bzzz. Well, she thought maybe one of the kids would send the message. Went and picked it up. My daily verse. What's my daily verse? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to your stature? <laughs> I'm telling you, it happened, right? <clears throat> God has a sense of humor. Right as she said that, was frustrated and said that. Bzzz, bzzz. She had to sit down and laugh at herself. You know God had that test bitch set up for the foundation of the world anyway. And why take you thought for raiment? Consider, consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And I say unto you that even Solomon and all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, uh, shall, not, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. What's, why Gentiles here? Out of the covenant. People outside of a covenant with God seek after things that God's already made provision for in the covenant. Amen? For your, here he goes, your heavenly father, your heavenly father. Jesus introduced, Jesus reiterating, Jesus introducing the concept to every group he could. Your heavenly father knows you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things uh, of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Here Jesus goes, hey look, you can get in a tight spot, but don't forget, he feeds the birds. You can get in a tight spot, don't forget. He closed the grass of the field with beautiful flowers. How many of you ever about see our wildflowers on the, you know, the, in the interstates and stuff, they have the wildflower places and, and there's all these Crazy. Oh, good. drive over to the Biltmore and look at the plants over there. You know, go and see the roses or the different the tulips in the tulip season and all that. Is it beautiful? I mean, you go, you go to Biltmore and they got the tulips out and there's every kind of color of tulip you can think of. And it's just gorgeous. Go out there with deer when the, when the sunflowers have matured. They got a, uh, probably about a mile and a half row or two mile row of sunflowers. And they're beautiful. They're all up, all smiling. I mean, someone say you kind of always hear that smile, a little smile for me, Rosemary. Oh, yeah. You kind of let you look at the sunflowers, that's what you're thinking of, you know. And they look like happy. They're the happy flower. All right? God, God did that. All right, we'll ride through the mountains. We love to go up and, and see when the rhododendrons are blooming up on the parkway. And you think, God, God's paintbrush. He did that. And if you took the time to do that, what about you?
Don't you worry about it. Stop, wor stop, stop fretting over what the Father will take care of. Why? Cast all that care on him. He cares for you. But see, Jesus said, he put in there, my Father. Because he wanted them to realize it's the care of the Father that will make the provision. Now that doesn't mean you don't tithe, you don't give, you don't do the things you're supposed to do. Because we come back right right to 2 Corinthians, it's right there in the scripture. It's, 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 it's Bible to do those things. But don't fret about it. Don't fret. Why? I have a Jesus is trying to introduce a relationship with God instead of a servanthood with God. My Father cares. The Father himself loves you. Over and over and over, Jesus talks about the Father. What the Father does. The Father's care. Why? Because he loves us. And he wants us to know that love. And he wants us to walk in that love. And he wants to experience that, us to experience that love. Can you say amen, glory be to God, Shondai, hallelujah. Somebody miss Shondai out there. Glory to God. Now when you think about the 23rd Psalm. He prepares a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Think about that. I heard Pastor Hagen preach this a number of years ago. Then about a year later, Dad picked it up, started preaching it. Dad Hagen started preaching it before he went home to the Lord. You know, Pastor's talking about, yeah, I went, you know, we had a, um, you got a table prepared for you, the presence of your enemies. Glory to God. You sit down at the table and you say, you know, we, how many, now, if you're like our family, when we sit down at the table, you know, it's so all everybody spread out, and we're hollering, pass the mashed potatoes, pass the fried chicken, pass the collard greens, hallelujah. Can somebody say amen? <clears throat> Are you here? Pass the hot sauce. Nathan, Nathan can't eat chicken anymore without Texas Pete on it. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I, yeah. Got to have that Texas Pete on it. Glory be to God. Got to have the cornbread. Now, my wife likes to make homemade biscuits. That's with buttermilk and lard and flour. Somebody talk, talk to me now. And when she's, in a, when she's got time, go get some hoop cheddar cheese and stick in them bad babies until it, it boils and cooks out right out of them. Hallelujah. Gets on the pan and gets hard. It, you know, hardens up. And you kind of pick the biscuit and the cheese up and fold it back up on top. Take a bite. Anybody, anybody hungry yet? Glory be to God. Hallelujah. You know how we cook our collard greens? We go get some, some salty uh, smoked meat. You know, usually we... Uh, uh, Lot of salt and pepper on it, put it in the water, boil it until the, all the salt and the pepper's out in the water and the fat has melted out into the water. Then you put the collard greens or the cabbage in there. Hallelujah. And boil them down. Glory to God. Amen. Are you here? Then you sit down at the table and you're sitting down at one end of the table and the collard greens are down and they'll say, somebody pass the collards. Hallelujah. And you got that going on your plate. Somebody pass the mashed potatoes. Hallelujah. Going on the plate. Praise God. I need the chicken. I need the rolls or, or the, the, the biscuits or the cornbread. Hallelujah. Are you hungry yet, Melanie? Huh? I'm making myself hungry. Except I'm not getting this for lunch. I looked in the refrigerator, and I'm, I'll guarantee you sometime this week there's going to be some fried okra on the plate. Hallelujah. Somebody brought Janie some okra. I don't eat okra. I just, it's too slimy. I don't care fried how you cook it. I just don't like it. You know, but the, but the kids like it. Janie likes it. So they're going to have some fried okra this week. Praise God. Amen. I'll be in Tennessee. I'll be eating something over there. Hallelujah. Now, we sit down, we eat that meal, and we just, you know, there's a table prepared for us. And on that table is everything we need. Hallelujah. Well, I want you to know the Lord has prepared a table before you. Hallelujah. Are you here? Glory to God. I need, I need a chair. Hallelujah. Y'all have to put this back together for tonight, all right? Yeah, hallelujah. The Lord prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Hallelujah. So I sit down there. I, the enemy of sickness. I say, pass some healing down here. Glory to God. I'm to prosperity. I, I, I'm having some money problems. Pass some prosperity down here. Glory to God. Get it on my plate. Glory to God. Oh, my mind's been oppressed. Pass me some deliverance down here. Praise be to God. I put that on the plate. Glory be to God. I'm telling you, you know, I need some peace in my house. Hallelujah. But pass the bowl of peace down here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Whatever I have need of, whatever the enemy is trying 
trying to bring against me. God has set a table before me in the presence of my enemy, praise God. And I'm just saying, pass it on down here. Hallelujah. Get me an extra plate. I'm going to fill them both up, praise God. Hallelujah. Go sit down and start digging in. Get me some molasses. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And in the presence of our enemies, the enemy of poverty, the enemy of life, the enemy of oppression, the enemy of sickness and disease, the enemy of calamity, I sit right down in the middle of that. And my Father has prepared a table that meets every need I have, praise God. And by faith, I reach out and I grab a hold of it and I put it on the plate and I consume it. Because my God has prepared the table. Can somebody say amen? amen? I said, can somebody shout glory? glory? What you need today? Now, something, now I'm going to tell you right now, if I'm sitting down the table and there's black-eyed peas down there, I say, keep them down at the other end. <laughs> I don't do black-eyed peas. I don't do crowder peas, and I don't do filled peas. Don't like the texture or the flavor. Now, I'll do garden peas, and I'll do green beans. I'll do some sweet corn. How many like that shoe peg corn, the white corn? Silver queen, they call it. Now, now there's, some, there's some corn we have that some, that some people see it. It's got the white and the yellow on it. Now, our folks call that uh, peaches and cream. I don't know why they call it that, but that's what they call it, peaches and cream. That is good corn. And if that's on the table, don't, don't, don't get it near me. You won't get it back down your end. <laughs> How about some rutabagas? Lord, have mercy. What it... When I sit down, I'm, sky, I'm, I'm checking the table out. What's down there? What's down there? Well, ooh, what's over there? Ooh. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to partake of all the things I, I want. When you sit down at the table of the Father, whatever you have need of, he's already got it on the table. He knows what you have need of before you ask or think. And you can reach up there and say, I need the healing bowl. I need the prosperity bowl. I need the deliverance bowl. I need to just have a joy dance bowl. A little dose of the Holy Ghost bowl. Hallelujah. Can somebody say amen? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.